In this video, I will talk about the fractures of the forearm, wrist and hand commonly covered in the MBBS curriculum. First, an overview of the relevant anatomy and radiology, followed by etiology and management of common forearm fractures, Montegia fracture and uh, Galeazzi fracture dislocations, Collies and Barton's fractures, and common hand fractures such as Bennett's fracture and uh, mallet injury of the finger. First, let's look at the forearm movements the proximal and the distal radio ulnar joints, along with the radio ulnar interosseous space is responsible for pronation and supination movements. The axis of pronation and supination passes from the center of the head of the radius through the interosseous space to the base of the ulnar styloid. Note that the radius rotates over the fixed ulna. Presence of adequate interosseous space is essential for a normal range of pronation and supination. Hand can be positioned to allow pronation and supination axis to pass through any of the fingers. When the hand is resting on the table, the pronation supination axis passes through the little finger. When the forearm is off the table, it passes through the middle finger. In activities such as turning a door key, note that the axis shifts towards the thumb. Keeping this in mind, adult forearm bone fractures either in isolation such as a radial shaft fracture or an ulnar shaft fracture or a combination of both bone fractures are treated by open reduction internal fixation with plates and screws. Etiology of these fractures vary from fall to road traffic accident and direct injury. Specific complications include malunion, non-union, especially of the ulna, and cross-union. All these lead to limited forearm movements as discussed earlier. When associated with significant soft tissue damage, compartment syndrome might also result. Modern management of these fractures in adults is usually an open reduction internal fixation with plates and screws. A Galeazzi fracture dislocation is when there is a fracture of the shaft of the radius associated with a distal radio ulnar joint dislocation. The radius fractures at the distal shaft and the DRUJ usually dislocates in the dorsal direction. In an isolated distal radial shaft fracture, distal radio ulnar joint injuries should be suspected. Complications associated with Galeazzi fracture dislocations include malunion, limited forearm range of movements, and chronic DRUJ pain. For these reasons, Galea's diffracted dislocations are treated surgically by open reduction internal fixation of the radial shaft fracture and either a closed or an open reduction, if necessary, an internal fixation of the distal radio ulna joint. Montegia fracture dislocation is where there is a fracture of the shaft of the ulna and proximal radio ulna joint dislocation. Since the radial head also articulates with the capitulum, the proximal radio ulnar joint dislocation manifests as a radio capitular dislocation as well. In an isolated proximal ulnar shaft fracture, radial head dislocation should be actively looked for. Complications of Montegia fracture dislocation include malunion, nonunion, restricted elbow and forearm range of movements. The treatment is open reduction internal fixation with plates and screws and the radial head usually reduces itself or may need a closed or an open reduction. A Collis fracture is the distal radial metaphyseal fracture. It's characterized by dorsal displacement and tilt, radial displacement, proximal migration of the distal fragment carrying the rest of the carpal bones and the hand with it. This leads to disruption of the distal radio ulnar joint. The usual mechanism of injury is fall on an outstretched hand with old age and osteoporosis posing significant risk in the development of these fractures. Complications of untreated or an inappropriately treated collis fracture include dinner fork deformity due to malunion, Carpelton syndrome due to compression of the median nerve in the narrowed space, rupture of the extensor pollicis longus tendon due to frictional rub over the fracture site, DRUJ pain and restricted forearm movements, and localized autonomic dysfunction leading to complex regional pain syndrome which may manifest as 
shoulder and hand stiffness. Diagnosis of these fractures is simple with classical history, clinical findings and by x-rays. Coming to treatment, fractures which are undisplaced or minimally displaced and in patients who are poor surgical candidates are treated non-operatively in a Collis cast after a close reduction if necessary. A Collis cast is a below elbow cast with forearm in pronation, wrist in palm flexion and ulnar deviation. A displaced fracture can be treated either by close reduction with percutaneous K wire fixation or by open reduction internal fixation with plates and screws. There has been a lot of emphasis on preventive measures of osteoporotic fractures which also apply to college fracture. Now a quick uh, note on the Smith's fracture also called reverse college fracture and is associated with OLR displacement of the distal fragment and the treatment is similar to college fracture. Next is Barton's fracture. It is the partial intraarticular fracture of the distal radius. Here, the displaced distal fragment carries the wrist joint, carpal bones, and the hand with it. Here, you can see the coronal split of the distal radius and the displacement. Complications include malunion, limited wrist range of movements, and osteoarthritis of the wrist. Standard treatment of Barton's fracture is open reduction internal fixation with a buttress plate. Next is scaphoid fracture. Scaphoid is the most commonly fractured carpal bone. Although a proximal row bone, it is a key link between the two rows of the carpal bones. The waist, which is the non-articular part, palpable just distal to the radial styloid, demarcates the proximal and the distal parts of the scaphoid. Radial artery is the main arterial supply to the scaphoid. Its dorsal carpal branch enters the dorsal ridge and supplies the majority of the proximal part of the scaphoid. Note that the blood supply to the proximal part of the scaphoid is retrograde from distal to proximal, like in head of the femur or the body of the talus and others. In case of fracture, this arrangement of blood supply predisposes the proximal part of the scaphoid to avascular necrosis. Olar part of the radial artery which continues as a superficial palmar arch gives a small branch that supplies the remaining minor part of the distal scaphoid. Scaphoid usually fractures due to a fall on an outstretched hand when the wrist is excessively dorsiflexed and the forearm is hypopronated. Based on the location, it can either be a proximal waist or the distal scaphoid fracture, although majority of the fractures happen through the waist. Clinically, swelling may be minimal, but the tenderness is elicited over the anatomical snuff box and over the olar aspect of the bone. The key to the diagnosis is clinical suspicion. Routine PA view and lateral views may be insufficient as shown here. Special views such as an oblique view in 45 degree pronation and PA view with ulnar deviation also called scaphoid view are often necessary. If the diagnosis is still uncertain, MRI would be helpful. Untreated scaphoid fractures can lead to long-term complications with significant disability in the wrist due to non-union and avascular necrosis, which are more pronounced when the fracture is more proximal. Scaphoid collapse in advanced avascular necrosis may lead to osteoarthritis of the wrist. An undisplaced scaphoid fracture is treated non-operatively by mobilizing in a thumb spike cast for about 6 to 12 weeks. However, if the fracture is displaced or is associated with other fractures or in case of a non-union, operative treatment in the form of closed reduction or an open reduction and internal fixation with a variable pitch screw such as Herbert screw is used. Next, we'll move on to Bennett's fracture. It is the partial articular fracture of the base of the thumb metacarpal. 
Here the metacarpal shaft migrates proximally, radially and dorsally due to the pull of abductor pollicis longus and the extensor pollicis tendons. The smaller proximal fragment remains reduced intraarticularly since it's held by the beak ligament. The main complications of Bennett's fracture is malunion leading to thumb base osteoarthritis and the treatment is close reduction internal fixation with multiple KYs. One last topic of this video is mallet finger. The range of movement in the distal interphalangeal joint of the fingers is 0 to 80 degrees. Flexion and extension are produced by the long flexor and long extensor tendons attached to the base of terminal phalanx. Flexor is stronger than the extensor. Mallet finger is also called baseball finger. It's the evolution of the long extensor tendon at its insertion at P3. Mallet injury is usually a bony avulsion. However, it could also be an isolated tendon avulsion as well. Typical mechanism of injury is eccentric contraction of the finger extensor when it's being forcibly flexed. Due to the injury, the DIPJ is flexed excessively by the unopposed pull of the flexor digitorum profundus tendon and the PIPJ compensatorily hyperextends. This results in a span neck deformity. The treatment is immobilization in a mallet splint for about six weeks, keeping DIPJ in full extension and allowing PIPJ range of movement. Surgery is rarely necessary. This is the end of this video. Thank you for watching.